Okay, so this is going to be session 22, session 22 in our uh, general introduction to Christian apologetics. And uh, right now we're in the middle of looking at some uh, non-Christian religious systems, faith systems that are still broadly Western in their thought. And uh, right now we want to introduce Mormonism. That's going to be our topic here for a few minutes. Anyone hear of Mormonism before? Mormonism, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How many people are very familiar with this cult, the Mormon cult? How many people could use a little bit of instruction? <laughs> okay. okay, this one here, you'll notice a lot in common with Islam. Okay, But Mormonism comes later in time. Remember, uh, Muhammad... Muhammad's first visions were like in 610. Remember that? This Mormonism, it originates not with Muhammad, but with Joseph Smith in 1830. Joseph Smith in 1830 in New York. Now, what's Joseph Smith's story? Guess what? He went out into the bush and he had a visit from an angel. In fact, uh, he had multiple visitations, uh, and he, is, he saw, actually in the bush, he saw God the Father, and he saw the Lord Jesus, and he had visits from Peter, James, and John, and John the Baptist, and all these guys coming, coming to see him, and angels came to see him, the angel Moroni came to see him. Okay, Joseph Smith's claim to fame, just like Muhammad, he's going to restore a corrupt, Christ, uh, Christianity's been corrupted he's going to restore it to the way it's supposed to be. One of the ways that he did this is he, he uh, introduced this thing called the Book, oh my goodness, the Book of Mormon. Mormon. The Book of Mormon, 1830. Okay, the story here is, I'll just give you the, the, the theology, okay? The story. The story is, according to Joseph Smith, an angel told him about a book that had been written on gold plates, gold, gold uh, plates bound together like a big spiral bound binder. Okay? This thing was written on, it took uh, somewhere, somewhere from 600 BC, BC to 421 AD. That's the time frame that the Book of Mormon covers, and that's the time frame in which the Book of Mormon was written. So the Book of Mormon wasn't written by Joseph Smith, according to him. It was written by others. Ancient Jewish people wrote the Book of Mormon. So obviously, lots of different authors in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and the Book of Mormon is very much like a Bible. It's got different books in it, books named after the guys that wrote them and so on, with, with chapters and verses and that. So 600, around 600 BC to 421 AD, the time frame covered in the Book of Mormon. And um, the story that is given in the Book of Mormon is quite remarkable. The Book of Mormon says that 600 BC, there was about 20 or so uh, Jews. They left the Holy Land and they came to the Americas. It was, right, it was right around the time of King Josiah in the Bible. Remember that? Around 600. Jeremiah's prophes prophesying then. So 20 Jews leave. They go across the ocean in a boat to the Americas. They get to the Americas. And these Jews, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. The good guys, they become the Nephites. And the bad guys... They become the Lamanites. Nephites, Lamanites. The whole book is racist. The bad guys, because they were so bad, they got dark colored skin and became the North American Indians, the native, the Aboriginal people. They, Mormons today believe you look at a, a First Nations person, they are Lamanite. They were cursed with that dark skin. Seriously. Seriously. I have lots of books. Of, I have Book of Mormon. I have different editions of the Book of Mormon. They also, the preface tells you all about it. Even today, you can pick it up. It'll tell you. 
So in 421 AD, the Nephites were wiped out. All you had were the Lamanites left. And all that's documented in the Book of Mormon. But didn't uh, God technically change his mind about black people? Yeah, that, see, the, when, was the, when was this book published? 1830. You could buy and sell black people in the 1800s. Slaves. The book is totally racist. The Mormon history is filled with racism. Now, think of it. You go back into our Bible, and you look at Paul's Athenian address in Acts chapter 17, and I think it's verse 26. What does Paul say? God has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And God is not far from every one of us. Right? He has set the bounds of our habitation so that we may seek him and find him. That's what Paul says. And Paul knew about, I can assure you, Paul knew about black people. <laughs> he knew about Ethiopians. Right? So, um, yeah, 1830, racism rampant. And also at that time, big questions about where the Native Americans came from. Lots of books being written at that time. I have a whole list of books. Uh, a View of the Hebrews by Ethan Smith was one book that was out there, predated the Book of Mormon. Lots of books. James Adar wrote a book about it. Uh, many books. So Joseph Smith, he comes on, onto the scene with this book that he says he translated. God gave him the gift to translate this ancient Hebrew-Egyptian hybrid language. And he translated it and published it in 1830. He's, on the cover, he's called the author and proprietor which I think he was, actually. <laughs> I think he was the author. But he says, later on he became a translator, he said, and um, published the book in 1830. And of course, it's full of all this racist idea here. And they got the, uh, the idea in that book that when Jesus was risen from the dead, he appeared in the Americas to these people. Right? So there's a whole history here. And there's you know, elaborate battles and all kinds of... I mean, the history here laid out for you in the Book of Mormon. Um, Archaeologically, there's not a single shred of evidence for anything that's in the Book of Mormon. There is just not one. I remember one uh, Mormon apologist, he, he talks about, about pre-actualized Mormon archaeology. Pre-actual archaeology. So in other words, we don't have a shred. Not a single arrowhead. There's supposed to be millions of people fighting uh, in this final battle. We can't find a single arrowhead and this area where they supposedly had a, this big battle and so on. So uh, Mormon archaeology, for all, their cl for all the Book of Mormon's claims, there's, um, there's nothing to substantiate that book at all. And in fact, if we were to examine the book, and I do in my course, I teach a whole morning, four hours on, on Mormonism, the Book of Mormon contains many telltale signs of fraud. It looks like a 19th century hoax. It really does. I mean plagiarism all the way through, and they quote the Bible, but they misquote the Bible, and uh, we can't get into all that right now, but it looks like a fraud. So, now the thing is with the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon is fiction, but the theology of the Book of Mormon is not that different from what we believe. That's kind of important. It still teaches a works-based gospel, which is, we've, we've got to reject that, right? You remember, um, look at Verses to write down. Colossians 2.10, Ephesians 2.8-9, Romans 4.5. Whoops. Romans 4, verse 5. You write those down because, very important, um, these all teach that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay? All the non-Christian cults, worldviews, Competing faith systems, they all deny that. They all deny the sufficiency of Christ. Mormonism is no different. Uh, the book of Ephesians here, we, are, we, we know it is by grace we, you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. The book of Mormon misquotes that and says, we know that we are saved by grace after all that we can do. The Bible doesn't teach that. After all that you can do. You can't do anything to earn your salvation. So anyway, very important verses to have in mind. But having said that, Book of Mormon theology is not that different. They believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay? But Joseph Smith had a very aberrant view of the Trinity, very aberrant, and it became more and more uh, blasphemous and incorrect as time went on. So 
The Book of Mormon, we would consider that a halfway house. You would have something like the Bible here, which is completely true. The Bible is 100% true. Then you have the, the Book of Mormon. It's, it's a corruption of Christian theology, but it's still kind of, I mean, virgin birth is in there, Jesus, Son of God, crucifixion, resurrection. Um, a halfway house to get to this thing called the doctrines and covenants. Doctrines and covenants. And then from there, you got another thing, a big long collection of writings called the Journal of Discourses. And this is as long as a huge collection of encyclopedias. Okay. What, see, the Mormons, the Mormons thought that Joseph Smith was a prophet. God spoke through a prophet, Joseph Smith. When Joseph Smith died, the movement came under the authority of another prophet, Brigham Young. And when Brigham Young died, it came under the authority of another prophet. They always have a living prophet. Okay? Now that, sounds, that sound, almost sounds like Roman Catholicism. The Roman Catholics have a living prophet, kind of. He's called the Pope. And when he speaks ex cathedra, he, he is infallible. He, he speaks uh, truth, right? And you, you don't question the Pope. The Mormons have their living prophet. And the Journal of Discourses, uh, this is the declarative statements by the, the church's living prophets over the ages, the Journal of Discourses. But Joseph Smith gives us doctrines and covenants. Uh, there's also a, a book called The Pearl of Great Price. Pearl of Great Price. That's another document of theirs. Um, so, to, to be honest with you, the Mormons have more inspired books than anyone could ever read. And they, say, and they think the Bible is authoritative. It has to be King James. And it needs to be interpreted correctly. Which means, if you read the Bible and you come across a theology that conflicts with Mormonism, that's a, that's a place that's either been corrupted, the text, or you're not translating it correctly or interpreting it correctly. It's the ace in the hole. You need the living prophet to tell you about it, right? So that's, um, that's the inspired writings of the, the Mormons. Uh, again, the charge of corruption, we could always go back to when, when, when this supposedly happened, we'd like to know, right? There's many, many promises in the Bible about preservation. God says his, his word will, his, the thoughts of his heart will extend to all generations in Psalm 33. Or Isaiah 40, verse 8, the, the, uh, the flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You know? the, God's word is incorruptible. So, now how do we talk to a Mormon? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there are, I, I can't really do this with any other cult, but with the Mormons, they made it very easy for us. So, Mormon theology, now... We could go like this. You have Mormon theology. This is their doctrine of, of God and the doctrine of salvation and, and doctrine of man and all that kind of stuff here. But all this, and Mormon theology is very complicated. It's, that's why Walter Martin wrote a book called The Maze of Mormonism. It's very weird and strange, you guys. You know, and I'll, we'll talk about it in, this morning yet, but, but all that labyrinth of strange doctrines and rituals and there's a lot of rituals. It all rests upon two pillars. One is the Book of Mormon, and the Mormons believe this too. They said, if you, can, if you can refute the Book of Mormon and show it's not true, you've destroyed Mormonism. Secondly, the Restoration. Joseph Smith, his whole uh, purpose under God was to restore Christianity, restore the Bible get back to what Christianity is supposed to be, right? Sounds like Islam, doesn't it? Well, let's talk about it for just a sec here. Let's call this pillar number one, and this will be pillar number two. Pillar one, the restoration. 
If you could show that the church was not in need of this kind of restoration, Joseph Smith becomes unemployed, and we don't need Mormonism. And, or, if you can show that the Book of Mormon is a fraud, then Mormon theology collapses. Either way, Mormon theology rests on these two pillars. As far as the restoration goes, you just need to consult your Bible. Uh, look, at all the, look at all the statements God makes throughout the scriptures that his word will endure forever, forever settled in the heavens. Um, just note, turn please to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Lots of verses, I'm just giving them to you as they pop into my head here, but you got to remember... According to, according to Joseph Smith, uh, according to Joseph Smith, after the death of the last apostle, John, basically around AD 100, basically, the church was gone. The church was eradicated. The church was not on planet Earth anymore. They're very clear about this in their writings today. The church was gone. And with it went its quote-unquote priesthood authority. Mormons are big on priesthood authority. They don't, they don't seem to understand that according to Peter and according to John, uh, we are all priests. We all have bold access to the throne of grace. That's Hebrews, the fourth chapter. But they've stratified the body of Christ so that you have a Melchizedekian priesthood and an Aaronic priesthood, uh, and then you have the underlings, uh, you know, and they've stratified the body of Christ that way. Um, but Christ is not divided like that. So Joseph Smith, he, he's got this idea that the, the church and its priesthood structure and authority is gone after about AD 100. And, every, and he was asked, or he asked God, he says, which church should I join? And God apparently told him, don't join any of them. They're all abominations. See, I had people, they, they say I'm too harsh on the Mormons. And I don't think so. I think he set the tone when he's calling my faith an abomination to God. And my faith comes just from the Bible. Those are fighting words. And let's get down to it, right? But uh, anyway, so the church is supposed to be gone. Look what Paul says in Ephesians Third chapter, chapter yeah, 3, verse 20. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul seemed to think that Christ would be glorified in the church, by the church, in the church, to, in all generations. Paul was not foreseeing some great apostasy or great falling away, um, and it would just be, what, a few decades from his own day. Paul wasn't seeing that. In fact, um, do you remember the book of Matthew, chapter 16? Go back to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And Jesus says something very, very interesting in verse 18. Matthew 16, 18, a favorite, of course, of our Catholic friends. Matthew 16, verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus talking to Peter. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. Now, right there... Uh, Jesus is not saying anything like what the Catholics claim here. I mean, he's not saying, Peter, I'm building the church on top of you. You are the chief cornerstone. Because Peter himself denies that. Peter says Christ is the chief cornerstone. We're all like living stones being put into this thing we call the church, the superstructure now. The foundation having been laid by the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. The point I'm trying to draw out here is that uh, Jesus said the gates of Hades would, would not prevail against the church. Now, if you're going to tell me that, that John died, A.D. 100, and we had to wait all the way until 1830 for the church to get reestablished, I think the gates of hell did prevail against the church. And, but 
once again, Paul's not seeing this. No one's actually seeing this, right? There's always a remnant, right? There's all, God always has his people on the earth. The church is here, indestructible. But in Joseph Smith's day, um, there was a, there was a, there was a, um, a dissatisfaction with the Reformation. In the 1800s, in the Americas, uh, Protestant Christianity thought the Reformation should have went further from Rome. We didn't go far enough from Rome, which I agree, too. Uh, and so there was this idea of restoration. Let's get back to the Bible. Let's get back to what Jesus was teaching. There, that was very, very a strong thought in the Americas in the 1830s. So you had lots of restorationist movements, not just Joseph Smith, lots. But you see, Joseph Smith did one better. He didn't just say, I'm going to get us back to the Bible. I'm going to restore the Bible because the Bible itself has become corrupt. And what he did, he introduced the Book of Mormon. I actually have a document for you to look at. It captured people's imagination like nothing else. Whether or not they could prove it was real didn't seem to matter to people. You know, this was the fervor of the day. And to boot, this book will explain where the North American natives came from, which is what was in everybody's mind. Where did these guys come from? How do they, where do they fit into earth history and human history? So Joseph Smith, right guy for the right time, kind of, to deceive many. Right. So I don't think there are lots of verses you can consult, um, just consult your Bible. Lots of verses that say there would be no need of a restoration. I think of John 15, 16. Jesus told the apostles, I chose you and ordained you <laughs> that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Right? That your fruit should remain, not become obliterated. Uh, even something real simple. Uh, remember the story of the, the woman that came and she, she cried at Jesus' feet? She washed his feet with her tears, a, a sinful woman? Jesus said, what has, what has been done here today, what she has done, will be, uh, it's basically part of the gospel almost. Like he said, this is going to be spoken of. Wherever the gospel is preached, you're going to hear about this lady, what she did for me. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Now, Christian missionaries, we go out into the world, legitimate Christian missionaries, with Bibles that contain that story. Jesus could say with assurance, that story will remain. It will be preached with the gospel. Because it's, it's going to be in the Bible, in other words, he's saying. Now, God made good on that. What makes us think that he would let essential gospel truths just sort of drop from the pages of the Bible? If he could keep that story about the woman intact, what makes you think the real essential stuff he was powerless to uh, keep in the Bible? That makes no sense to me, you know. Okay, uh, and then secondly, the Book of Mormon looks, it really does look like a 19th century fraud. I mean, it's just full of all kinds of anachronisms, errors, language errors. It's, it, it's going to leave it there, <laughs> okay? But there's lots. If you want more on that, I have lots on that, okay? Mormon uh, theology proper is very problematic because Mormon theology, under Joseph Smith, Originally, he taught Trinity, an aberrant kind of Trinity. He taught a sort of tritheism at first. Tritheism. Three gods. God, the Father was a God. The Son was God. The Holy Spirit was a God. But they are three gods. Okay? Not one God, three persons. Later on, he revealed that he is a polytheist. Later on, he revealed that innumerable gods. And he taught this thing called uh, eternal progression. Eternal progression. So you evolve from a man to a god. It's very sexist too. W women, it's only men can become real gods. Women become sort of goddesses, but they, all they do is procreate. Spirit babies to populate planets. So on Mormon theology, and they used to be real sheepish about this in, in, later in the 20th century, now they're coming out because it sounds very new age. They're, they're much more open about this. They do teach that, that you can become a god if you go through all the temple ordinances and you do everything prescribed to you by the Mormon cult. They're actually much more open about this now. But, uh, so they're polytheistic. 
innumerable gods, eternal progression, you're always getting better at being God. God the Father, can you imagine? God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in their theology, was once a man on a planet, like you. And he evolved into Godhood, and he's getting better at being God. And Jesus himself evolved in, in his Godhood. Okay, um, problems. How do we talk to people who think like this? Well, you can go to the Bible. Numerous places in the Bible that say there's only one God. Tons of places. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Isaiah 43. Lots of places. You just go from Isaiah chapter 40 to 45. Check it out. How many times God says there's just one God, that's it, just me. <laughs> okay, only one God. Um, so polytheistic, the holy polytheism view is out. Um, in fact, you know, you go to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, Hebrews 6, what does God say there? He says, I swore, I swore an oath to Abraham. And guess what? I wanted to confirm my promise with an oath, so I swear by myself because I, I could swear by none greater. See, God recognizes there's no, there's no other gods beyond me. There's no infinite number of gods. There's no gods that, that I could... Because people swear by the greater always, right? You swear by that which is greater. God says, there's just me. I swear by myself. So lots of verses that are monotheistic like that, okay? Um, the biggest problem I have here with Mormon theology... Well, lots of problems, but... One of the biggest problems is that the gods, they really are, they really are not really not eternal. You know, they kind of evolve. They start off on a, on a planet, finite and sinful, and you have to go through all the ordinances and so on, and you evolve into godhood. But what is eternal and uncreated? Space and matter. The gods are not eternal, but space and matter are eternal. The gods, see, the gods themselves are made of material. God the Father in Mormon theology is just a really big man. It is true. You know, and, and he's, a, he's a polygamist. I mean, in the old days, if you want to be a god, you have to have many wives in, in Mormon theology. And when the U.S. government clamped down on, on um, polygamy, mainstream Mormonism backed down and said... We just got a new revelation. Can't have many wives anymore. <laughs> and that caused a split. You still have uh, branches of within the Mormon tradition. I mean, there's over a hundred different um, branches, uh, religious traditions that claim Joseph Smith as their founder. You know, and many of them are polygamist in their thinking because it was such an important part of the doctrine. Eh? But anyways, so the gods are not eternal on Mormon theology, but space and matter are. But what are space and matter? That is a big question mark. What is controlling space and matter? The gods can't be doing this because space and matter uh, is what they're comprised of. And what you end up with is space and matter are very mysterious. And because space and matter are mysterious, once again, guess what becomes ultimate around here? Chance. The gods can't predict into the future. The gods have no idea what matter and space is going to do moment by moment. There's no general uniformity that can be guaranteed. The gods end up being just as ignorant as us in these matters, in metaphysical matters. You see the problem there? You need a god who's transcendent above all of it to guarantee general uniformity, to guarantee the intelligibility of the world. To prescribe objective morality, you need a God that's transcendent. Now, the, the Islamic God doesn't help us because he's so transcendent, we don't know if he even cares about us. We don't know what his character is. The Christian God is transcendent. The Christian God is above all this stuff. He's a Christian God made space, time, and matter. Our God is above all that. And yet our God reached into the created order to talk to us. And he guarantees some things, and we trust him. You see, it's a huge difference here, isn't it? So that's one of the problems. Now, I mean, other problems too. If, if space and matter are eternal, then that means the actual number of events that have happened uh, in universe history has, is eternal, is um, infinite. And you can't have an actual infinite number of things. We covered that earlier in the course, remember? 
So basically, Mormon doctrine leads to absurdities and contradictions. And it's thoroughly anti-biblical. You know, um, just, go, just go to Isaiah chapter 43. Let's just look at that verse because it's, it's quite good. Isaiah 43. It might be a pretty good segue into our look at the Jehovah's Witnesses while we're at it. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, 10. Oh man, it's all good stuff here. Isaiah 43, and we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my, cho- and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, And besides me, there is no Savior. Now, that's a great verse to show your Mormon friends. You say, I don't know what I'm going to be in the future, but one thing I'm not going to be is a God. Because it says right here, nothing, no gods before him, no gods after him. Wonderful verse. Amen. (laughs) Amen to that. Okay. All right. That's a very cursory look at Mormonism. Any questions about Mormonism? Yeah. Where does the name come from? Uh, I think it comes from one of the writers of one of the supposed books of Mormon. <laughs> Mormon was uh, one of the writers, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, those guys evolved into, into uh, godlike characters too, right? The angel Moroni was once a man and becomes a, a, a demigod almost. You know? it's, a very str- it's very strange. I'm telling you, but anyhow, uh, let's get on with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Believe me, there's so much more we can talk about. But the JWs, who has heard of these fellows? Okay, we don't have to spend lots of time on them. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses starts with a guy named Charles Taze Russell. If you're interested, that's the guy. 1870s, Pittsburgh. He becomes the leader of a Bible study group. And uh, very quickly, Russell becomes the leader of the Bible study group and recognized as the pastor of the group. Uh, Russell was, uh, as far as I can tell, not very well educated. He had no concept of Greek or Hebrew. He had very little um, expertise in hermeneutics. His, his uh, approach to Bible interpretation, sadly wanting. And, um, but he, I don't know if he's a charismatic guy or what, but he got this following. And he wrote six volumes of something he called Studies in the Scriptures. A seventh was added after his death. Studies in the Scriptures, six volumes. And it, very clear, he said, if you put the Bible down... Don't pick it up again. But you read my, my six volumes, you'll be in the truth. Right? I have lots of quotes from... Because from him comes this thing called what? The Watchtower. Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Watchtower. He's the founder of this. Okay, so anyhow, lots of... Um, lots of printed material comes from the Watchtower. You got Watchtower Magazine, Awake Magazine, tons of tracks, tons of... They're just pumping out this literature night and day, okay? Um, but anyway, the Watchtower says, you know, lay down your Bible, study the studies in the scriptures for two years. You do that, you'll be in the light, you'll be in the truth. You'll know what the Bible teaches. But if you don't read those things and you just read the Bible, you're going to go into error, and they say, and get this, they say, if you do this, you're going to slip back into all the errors of Christendom, like classical Christendom. You'll, you're going to start thinking like those guys. And you read that and you want to say, exactly. <laughs> classic Christian theology, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, we hold to those things, of course we do. Um, so basically, uh, the cult is based on the teachings of Charles Russell. Now, it's, it's kind of funny because Charles Russell is kind of uh, 
in, in many ways, I think an ignoramus, a charlatan. He, he, was, he was scamming people, selling mystery wheat and all this kind of stuff, miracle wheat, you know, snake oil salesman, basically. Uh, anyways, um, there was a kind of a split, eh? And, and constantly predicting when the end of the world's going to come and the kingdom's going to constantly date setting, constantly getting the dates wrong, right? A whole, ba- a whole series of dates. We know the Lord's coming on this day. We know the kingdom's going to be established on this day. All the way to 1975, they've been doing this. You know, and it obviously hasn't happened. Anyways, um, now it's kind of funny because mainstream Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to be associated with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Many don't, though. Many don't. Um, most of the ones I talk to don't want to. But you do, you do, there is a split here. You've got the mainstream JWs, and then you have die-hard Russellites. They call themselves Russellites. They believe that Jesus did return already in 1874. Established his invisible kingdom. So there was a split. So... These guys want to distance themselves from Russell. These guys don't. But guess what? The theology is the same. You know, these guys say the Lord returned in 1914. They say he returned in uh, 1874. Big deal. It's you know, an invisible kingdom with, a, with an invisible Jesus here. But um, So basically, uh, what makes them different from us? What are some things that make them different from us? Yeah, they, they, What's that? They don't accept the Holy Spirit. Right. They deny, first of all, they deny the Trinity. Absolutely, they deny the Trinity. They think the Trinity comes from the devil. So you just got to find verses in your Bible that tell you that Jesus is God. Right. Can anyone think of a verse right off the bat? Where can you go in the Bible to show that Jesus Christ is God? John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, Perfect. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, the Word was God. John 20, 28. Thomas looks at Jesus and says, My Lord and my God. Blessed are you. Uh, lots of verses talk about Jesus. Romans 9, 5. Jesus Christ is called the eternally blessed God. Right? Was it Titus 2, 13? Looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just all the way through. The pastoral epistles, if you're taking notes. Go, 1 and 2 Timothy. Read those pastorals. Look at all the times you read that God is Savior. And then look in the next breath, he calls Jesus Savior. It's just all the way through. So you just got to super saturate. How many times is Jesus called the creator? How many times is God called the creator? How many times is Jesus called the savior? God is called the savior. How many times does the Bible say you only worship God, don't worship anything but God, and then Jesus accepts worship? Right? Particularly Matthew's gospel. Consult Matthew's gospel and watch Jesus accept worship all the time. And yet you're not supposed to worship anything but God, right? Um... So they deny the Trinity. There's lots of verse passages to show that um, the whole God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. Actually, Acts chapter 5 for verses there to show you the Holy Spirit is God. Acts 5 to show you that. Um, so they deny the Trinity. They deny the resurrection of Jesus. I wonder if you knew that. They deny that Jesus rose from the dead bodily. Okay? Where would you go to show that Jesus rose bodily from the dead? Where could you... I'm thinking of two verse passages. I think of Luke 24, where Jesus says, uh, Handle me and see, a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. And then he asked for some food and they gave him food to eat. It's almost like that passage, Luke 24, was written just for the JWs. Because they say he rose a spirit creature. His physical body has been destroyed. That's not what the Bible teaches. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for uh, information there that his body was risen bodily from the dead. Corporeal body, a real body. So they deny the Trinity. They deny the resurrection. They deny hell. They don't think, they don't think that the, the people who reject God's gospel, the wicked, they don't think that those people are going to go uh, into the lake of fire for conscious torment. They think you just get annihilated. Uh, and yet, um, if you go to Revelation chapter 14, just take a look at Revelation 14. And this, by the way, this was the first domino to fall for Charles Taze Russell. This was the first classic Christian doctrine that he despised. He didn't like the idea of hell. 
So he um, just denied it. So Revelation chapter 14, uh, beginning verse 9, I'll just pick it up at verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now that right there, that's called eternal conscious torment. That's not annihilation. The smoke of their torment ascends day and night forever and ever. They have no rest. See? So they deny hell. They deny, um, they deny the physical resurrection. They deny the physical, obviously they're going to deny the physical second coming of Jesus. They deny that too. Uh, they say it's some invisible thing. He just, he just mysteriously came either in 1914 and set up an office there at, in uh, Brooklyn, or, um, or he came mysteriously in 1874, whichever. Uh, and yet, uh, Book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, it says this, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Uh, Zechariah talks about the physical return of Jesus. Christ himself talks about it. He says, as lightning flashes from the east into the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. People are going to see him. It will be very, very obvious when Jesus returns. In fact, he's going to land on... Zechariah 14 says... He will land on the Mount of Olives and his feet will split that mountain in half and form a giant valley. You know, it's a physical uh, return of Christ. Uh, and lastly, well, and there's other doctrines they deny, but for time. Lastly, they deny that you have a soul spirit. They deny that you have a non-material part of your body. So they are sort of physicalists in that sense. Uh, and yet, if you actually believe that, you would run into all the problems that my opponent last week ran into, trying to account for the validity of thought, trying to account for the content of beliefs and so on. But Matthew 10 and verse 28 is a pretty good passage here to show that you do have a non-material part of you. And many, many, an avalanche of verses. This is just one that I selected, but there's many. Uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 10, 28, "'Do not fear those who kill the body, "'but cannot kill the soul.'" but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And again, there's many, many verse passages. Uh, Jesus brings that little girl to life, Jairus' daughter, and it says her spirit returned to her, and she came to life again. Uh, you're to, according to uh, Paul's epistle to the, to the Thessalonians, uh, you're to sanctify yourself wholly to God, body, soul, and spirit. You know, there's Lots of verse passages that speak of that, that um, distinction there. We are, we, are, we are substance dualists. You have a body, yes, but you also have a non-material nature called the soul spirit. And they're working in conjunction with each other. The JWs think you just have a body, that's all you are. And of course, the Bible denies that. So, so that, those are some of the things that would make us different than the JWs. Again, of course, a works-based salvation, we deny that. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Okay. So those are... Uh, those are our three basic, broadly Western, um, non-Christian competing faith systems. Okay. Any questions about any of that that you got confronted with today? A whole lot of information. Okay, well, you guys all know how to get a hold of me. If you have any questions, comments, um, you guys get a hold of me. Let's pray together, and then um, we'll be dismissed, okay? Father God, in Jesus' name. Uh, we come to the throne of your grace to thank you for this precious time we could be together, Lord. Thank you for these two sessions this morning. Thank you, God. Help, help us to be mindful and, and, uh, and caring towards people who don't yet know you, people who have gotten themselves into false faith systems. Uh, Lord, we want to speak intelligently to these people. We want to speak lovingly to them. Uh, most of all, we want to speak biblically. Help us, God. Equip us. Train us. 
May we be powerful and effective in kingdom building work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord.